Thank you so much, Dale and Tom and everyone for um, for inviting me uh, and making uh, us a part of this. So yeah, uh, my name is Michael DeYoung. I am the curator and archivist at the Thunder Bay Museum from Southern Ontario originally, but I came up here in uh, 2017. Um, and yeah, so I'll, I, I wanna start by just saying a little bit about um, the museum itself before I delve into the exhibit and then some of our archival resources that may be of interest to, uh, to uh, all of uh, you fine folks. So yeah. Um, so yeah, so we are the Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society officially, um, we typically go by just Thunder Bay Museum. And uh, we date back all the way to 1908. Um, we, our building is currently, uh, we've been in a few buildings over the years, but we're currently in the former Fort William Police Station Courthouse. We are a historical society and museum, and um, we still publish um, a volume called Papers and Records, which is a, a peer reviewed uh, publication every year. Uh, this used to be a, a typical thing for historical societies to do, but we're one of the last institutions to still do that. But I'll talk more about that uh, later on. So our collection encompasses um, artifacts from Thunder Bay's history um, and, and all of Northwestern Ontario, although obviously we, we focus primarily on Thunder Bay, Fort William and Port Arthur. Uh, we have exhibits and programming that, uh, that reflect that. Um, it's really, really diverse. I, I can't even I can't even summarize it. Perhaps our, our star artifact in the collection is a Albertosaurus skeleton, um, somewhat non not creatively named Albert, um, who is currently in hibernation uh, to the disappointment of many children. But he'll be back before too long. So all, all sorts of things at the Thunder Bay Museum. Um, we have art shows. Uh, we have exhibits on on all manner of um, things relating to the history of this area. So yeah, so the idea for this exhibit sort of popped into my head when I was just driving down uh, Broadway um, in the direction of Fort William Historical Park. Uh, I just sort of thought 1821, 2021, you know, uh, I wondered, I started asking around if anyone else is doing anything. Um, and uh, eventually we came up with this. Um, just recognizing that it's been 200 years since this very significant event. Um, everyone at the museum contributed in some way. Um, though most of it uh, was myself and our exhibits curator, Sydney Belouz. Uh, we're really pleased with, um, with what we came up with and uh, we're really grateful to our partners as well. Um, as you can see in the, in the back, there are some costumed mannequins. Uh, we don't have extensive fur trade artifacts. We have some, but not extensive fur trade artifacts in our collection. Um, and so we're grateful to Fort William Historical Park uh, for, for assisting us uh, that way. Um, they were a natural partner to reach out to, um, obviously. Um, I wanted to start, uh, well, the exhibit starts by acknowledging um, that uh, the land that these events took place on uh, was occupied by Indigenous peoples for centuries before any of these things happened, before anyone um, traded furs and sent them to Europe. Um, and so we, we, we think that's very important. And uh, not only that, but we do our best um, in the exhibit to uh, to weave the story of Indigenous peoples in this area into the story as much as possible, uh, recognizing the impact that this trade had on them uh, from from declining uh, game populations um, to to disease, uh, recognizing that it did have a significant significant uh, and often detrimental impact. Uh, but also recognizing their role uh, as partners um, in the fur trade. Uh, we talk, of course, as well, uh, particularly after the merger about the development of treaties uh, that responded to colonial encroachment in the area from the industries that took the place of the, the fur trade after it declined here. Um, we talk about the ways in which those treaties were often broken, um, particularly as an example, the way that Fort William First Nation uh, was forced out of their uh, their land directly south of the river uh, opposite the uh, what was the fort uh, and then pushed them into areas further south uh, to make way for industrial uh, and railway development. We also talk about the growth of the um, the Métis people. We don't do that. We can't do this justice in the space that we have because it's a really important story. Um, but we talk about the growth of the sense of identity of the Métis people, their role obviously in supplying 
supplying and participating in the fur trade as well. Uh, the exhibit continues, uh, it's on two floors. This, the first floor, uh, or well, rather our second floor um, in the previous slide is where it starts and where the sort of the narrative is established, um, where the story is, is sort of developed through text, photographs, paintings, and some artifacts. It continues in our third floor and what in the space we refer to as our antechamber, where we basically put the artifacts that couldn't fit in the second floor. Um, in and of themselves, but we have some pretty interesting things. Uh, as you can see, there's two flags, one from each company, which uh, we think is really fitting. Um, one of them was in our collection. One of them was, uh, again, generously loaned to us from the fort. Uh, we have some fur packs, of course, just to sort of add to the, the feel. Um, you can't really see the display cases uh, just due to the angle of the photo, but we have some furs um, also, again, from Fort William. Um, not only of beaver, but some of the other animals that uh, were a key part of the fur trade as well. Uh, we have uh, paintings, we have maps. Uh, we, we tried to make use of maps as much as possible. Uh, what you see on the wall are mostly reproductions, of course. Um, but yeah, the maps sort of tell the story, particularly of the, the later development of the area around Fort William. Uh, as it became what we now know as the East End, or at the time was the Coal Docks, but I'll say more about that later. Uh, oh, actually, I'll say more about that right now. Um, so uh, we also, of course, make use of photographs, um, which obviously are, are more useful for the later period of the history that we interpret. Um, I'm not going to talk extensively about the the, the circumstances of the actual merger and the the the, um, the rivalry beforehand, the Pemmican Wars and all that. Partly, um, I mean, David already covered that very well earlier, uh, and of course, Rainy Lake House covers that very well in the chapter in one of the chapters about um, John McLaughlin. I was sort of chuckling as I was reading that because it really summarizes that that very well. So I'm not going to go too much into detail on that, um, and I, I, I'm assuming many many of us are, are reasonably familiar with that story by now. I do want to talk a little bit about how the uh, exhibit covers, uh, relates the story of the merger to Northwestern Ontario. Um, we talk about, uh, of course, we talk about the occupation of Fort William. Um, and of course, we talk about the decline of Fort William after 1821, when um, it still operated as a fur trade post, but it's, it's certainly declined in importance because of trade routes shifting to Hudson's Bay um, as a part of George Simpson's um, uh, changes um, after he basically took control. And um, we talk as well, of course, about industrial development in uh, what is now Thunder Bay, particularly towards the end of the 19th century. Um, so as you can see uh, on the right-hand side, we really, this is probably one of the more fascinating images in the, um, uh, in the exhibit, but uh, as you can see on the right-hand side are the uh, the buildings of the old Fort William uh, in, the, in really the last decade of its life. I don't recall the exact date on this photo. Uh, right directly to the left of it, of course, you see the CPR coal docks, and that, of course, is why that neighborhood eventually became referred to as the coal docks, uh, literally right next to, to those buildings. Uh, very shortly after this photo was taken, those buildings were demolished entirely and are now under the rail bed. And I'm really um, grateful that David was able to show that that map that shows the exact interplay of where the fort was, because it's really, really fascinating. Uh, and of course, uh, overall on the left hand side, you see one of the early grain elevators on the Kaministiqua. So it really just shows sort of the, the, the story of um, uh, the, um, the later chapter of Fort William's life, sort of all in one photo. On, on the left, of course, you see the monument that uh, marks exactly where the fort is. That monument was erected by the Thunder Bay Historical Society in, in its early years, I think in 1916, and still stands today. And it, it has also become a provincially recognized heritage site as well. Um, yeah, and of course, we also, again, um, we talk about the growth of the Indigenous community around uh, Fort William um, after the merger and uh, how that became sort of uh, became uh, eventually became a Fort William First Nation and, and uh, the treaties again. Uh, we really think it's important to recognize that story as well. We don't want to overstate the case in terms of the causality of all this. I, I mean, quite obviously, the fur trade 
was going to decline uh, over the course of the 19th century, regardless of whether there was a merger or not. But nonetheless, we, we think 1821 um, is significant in that it really marks uh, the end of one chapter in Northwest Ontario and the beginning of a different chapter um, as well. Uh, I definitely want to recognize our exhibit partners. Again, I mentioned Fort William Historical Park. Um, many of the artifacts, including those uh, at the left, some uh, examples of trade items uh, were, were generously donated or, or loaned from their collection. Uh, David in particular um, was enormously helpful um, through the course of this exhibit in, uh, in helping us source and, uh, and helping us borrow these artifacts. So they really help uh, them come alive supplementing artifacts from our own collection. And uh, the Champlain Society as well. Um, the Champlain Society uh, has been collecting uh, and interpreting historical documents um, from all many aspects of Canadian history, but they have a, a, an excellent fur trade collection. They gave us access to that collection uh, in order to help develop the text of this exhibit. And um, I, I should briefly mention, I mean, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Champlain Society. Um, I believe their membership uh, it's somewhere, I don't recall exactly, it's not the cheapest membership out there, but some of you who are particularly interested in this may find it worth looking into because the documents that they have uh, online are a treasure trove of um, fur trade re related resources and your membership gets you access to these at the tip of your fingertips from the comfort of your living room. So it may be worth looking into. Uh, but again, we we're grateful to them for um, for helping us with this exhibit. And of course, um, Fort William has its own important archival collection as well that David touched on earlier. Uh, and I also like to thank, uh, recognize all the generous donors, uh, individual donors who helped um, with this exhibit as well. Uh, we did have an exhibit opening back in October um, and uh, we had representatives from all of our partners um, uh, that exhibit is that exhibit opening rather is recorded and is available on our Vimeo channel. And uh, again, Fort William was uh, kind enough to send over um, costumed interpreters, uh, one of whom was there, the Forge representative um, at the event, uh, to help bring it alive. Um, forgive me, Vic Victoria, were you one of the other one of the, the interpreters as well? Sorry, yes, uh, I was the other one there. Okay, great. I, I, um, I'm not good at hanging on to names after brief interactions, but I sort of pieced that together from the chat. So good to see you again, and thank you for coming to our event. Um, yeah, so this exhibit is open until June. Um, so I, I again, I, I hope uh, that uh, many of you um, are, are able to hop the border and, uh, and come uh, please give drop me a line. I'll, my email is at the end of the presentation, and I'll happily give you a, a curator's tour of the exhibit, so to speak. Uh, I'm going to switch gears to talking about our archival collection um, that may be of interest uh, to uh, to many of you. Um, quite obviously, we don't have the size, the volume of collection that Fort William has, but we do have some um, documents that are interesting. Uh, there's two main um, archival fonds that we uh, that are, are obviously relevant here. The first is the smaller one. It's the Northwest Company phone, um, which consists mostly of one document, but one very, very interesting document. Um, as you can see, it is a bill of lading uh, for the canoes that uh, left from appropriately for this group from Lac La Pluie um, between 1806 and 1809. So um, each of these pages basically tells you who and what was on each canoe heading uh, into the interior. So really a fascinating um, document from, uh, from that era that uh, if you're really interested in the logistics of the fur trade, and again, you can see the, the food that they carried with them, uh, not only for their own use, but to supply the, uh, the interior fur trading posts. Uh, so yeah, so that's available in our archives. Um, I believe it's digitized as well, but I have to check on uh, on the status there. But um, uh, anyone is welcome to come and see it by appointment. Uh, it's also interpreted in one of our papers and records articles uh, that uh, that sort of takes this document and sort of explains everything in a little bit more detail. Uh, the second collection that may be of interest is uh, the Hudson's Bay Company font. Uh, 
Um, quite obviously, we are not the primary repository of Hudson's Bay Company records. That would be in Winnipeg. Uh, but we do have a collection, um, mostly from the latter period of Fort Williams uh, period between 1821 and uh, its eventual demise in the 1880s. Um, one of the perhaps the most notable documents in there is the one I took a little snippet of that that left. It's a it's a copy, I should say. It's not the original, but it is a copy of Lord Selkirk's daybook uh, during the occupation of the fort. Um, I was only able to skim through it. I mean, most of the stuff in there is is relatively banal, you know, who went where and when. There's nothing terribly dramatic in it. But still, it's a fascinating insight to that um, brief uh, period of history at Fort William. Uh, the remainder of the documents in that collection are diaries and letters, um, mostly from the, the latter period, from the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, so that sort of tell a story of the, the late period of, uh, of Fort Williams existence. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our photo collection as well. Um, we have uh, just around 600,000 photographs in our collection. Uh, about 50,000 of them have been digitized and a little bit more each year, though our digitization program has sort of been on hold since COVID. Um, as an example of photo, I thought it'd be really cool for this book group to see if we had a, a photograph of Rainy Lake House. Uh, I came up empty, but I, I don't know enough about the history of that site to, to even know whether it, there is any photographs. I don't know how long it lasted after 1823, to be honest. Maybe some folks here know more about that than I do. The closest I could find was this photograph, which is undated, unfortunately, but it, it, it appears to be from the 1890s or the early 1900s. Uh, looking from Fort, uh, rather from uh, the American side of the border to nor uh, northward to Fort, what is now Fort Francis. Um, so, yeah, I, I really hoped I could find a, a photo of, uh, or, or even a sketch of the fort, but I didn't come up with anything there. But yeah, our photograph collection um, is extensive. Quite obviously, it's not going to help you too much with the 1820s and 1830s but it will help you with the 1870s and 1880s and 1890s if you're interested in, again, that latter chapter of the fur trade in Northwestern Ontario. Um, and then um, I mentioned earlier papers and records, uh, which is uh, could be a valuable uh, resource to you. Um, I took a quick look at our bibliography uh, of articles from it that relate to the fur trade. Um, one of them, I'll, I'll show you a few of them. One of them from uh, 1873, one, one of our earlier papers um, describes the that brief rivalry between the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company along the Kaministiqua that I mentioned earlier. Um, so again, just some really, th these are again our, our peer reviewed um, works. Um, they're professionally done. Um, and also, I mean, apart from the articles themselves, the, uh, the footnotes in them can, if you're really, really interested in delving into these topics, can lead you much further down a rabbit hole if you want to go. Uh, another example, um, this is the one I mentioned earlier that, um, that describes in, in greater detail the, the bill of lading, uh, the, the bills of lading rather. Uh, we have an art article that may be of interest. Um, uh, it's called Fur Trade Rivalry on the Rainy River uh, between 1793 and 1797. So that also very much is relevant to, to this group uh, because it describes the early history of Rainy Lake House and the other fur trading posts um, in that area. Uh, really interesting article as well. And again, there's a few other uh, really, uh, there's probably 10 or 15 really good articles on the fur trade um, in this journal. And a membership to our museum does give you access to uh, to these journals, and uh, and also, of course, one gets the the latest one gets mailed out to you every year. Um, I'm well ahead of schedule here. I didn't really know how long this would take, so I guess there's plenty of time for questions. But uh, I just wanted to member mention that our membership uh, starts at uh, a very reasonable thirty dollars. Uh, again, it includes uh, papers and records. And um, you see our, our website there, our memberships, and uh, feel free to drop me a line um, with the email address there.
so yeah, again, I'm sorry, this didn't take as long as I thought it would, but um, I welcome questions. So Michael, you, you showed in the one picture, the monument that's there and um, um, one of the photos I've seen of it shows the last time I actually saw it in real life, it seemed a little not taken care of. And, and I see a more recent photo where it seemed to be in better shape. Who's who's taking care of that monument? Is it the museum? No, Parks Canada. Parks Canada. I, I'm, yeah. Yeah, Parks Canada, because they, they now have um, declared it a um, yeah. national historic site and, and nicely put their plaque right smack dab in front of it as they want to do to get, you know, the front billing, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but for the folks on, on the phone, so when you go over to the East End, if you'll recall the map that David had showed um, with the rail tracks and then the, the footprint of the fort buildings, it's my understanding this thing sits pretty much where the council house was, which is where the merger actually occurred um, on paper, where the people sat. Um, easy to get to, um, and I think that's something that when we get to come up to uh, have a group out to Fort William and to the museum that we'll certainly make that a stop to go and check that out. Um, but I'm glad that you had a picture of that and showed that. The other thing I was um, uh, wondering about was um, the founding father of the Historical Museum Society. I understand his name was Peter McKellar. Correct. He was and a character so, in and of himself. Yeah. yeah. So he, it, Lots of uh, McKellar names in the city of Thunder Bay for, for the folks um, from south of the border. Um, but what, a, what an insight to, to make this such an important thing to develop a historical society. Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. yeah. Um, Tom, I'll leave it for you for any more questions there. I have something else to ask Michael before we finish, um, just in closing, because it's going to take us in a different direction. Yeah, just um, could you elaborate a little bit more, Michael, on uh, the Champlain Society? I don't, I don't think that's well known. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I'm not uh, there. The connection probably possibly starts here because their president is the vice president of our board and also a friend of mine. So, I mean, we we know them that way. Um, he's one of those people that's on like 10 boards. Um, but, um, but yeah, they're, they're, um, I've never delved into it too much. Um, again, they generously gave us access to their online collection, but they've been collecting and preserving documents, um, from, uh, key parts of Canadian history for, for a long, long time. Um, obviously their, their focus has shifted over the years. I mean, obviously they were inspired by, um, the explorers to some degree. And obviously, as, as different directions in Canadian history has come come around, um, they've they've shifted a little bit from that. But um, I, I, I'm not the best person to give uh, a, an excellent overview of their of their organization because I, I uh, I'm not extensively familiar with myself. But in the the Vimeo link that I shared with our opening, um, their their representative again, our, our who, who was wearing several hats at that event, uh, but in this case, the president of the Champlain Society. Uh, spoke at our event and described, um, gave a very good overview of, of what the organization does. And uh, again, their, their membership uh, um, it can give you access to a lot of these documents. Sorry, that's not uh, as much of an elaboration, but, uh, but they're worth checking out. I think it's just champlainsociety.ca or something like that. Could you, um, could you talk just a little bit about the um the plans for the exhibit about uh, travel from Lake Superior to Lake of the Woods. Is that something that's on your... Wait, sorry, the, from which, sorry? The, um, um, is there an upcoming exhibit through the Historical Society on travel from Lake Superior to Lake of the Woods? There is um, uh, a lecture coming up. Yes. Um, in January on that topic. Sorry, I, 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 I got a little wires crossed there. But yes, it is a lecture. I don't I didn't org I don't organize our lecture series. So I don't know a ton about it. But I believe it, it is both in person and online. Um, and yes, it's it's sort of about um, efforts to preserve the, the historical significance of the route between Ooh. Fort William, uh, or, or Thunder Bay and Lake of the Woods. I, I can't say much more about it than that. But if you search Thunder Bay Museum, uh, lecture series, um, it will give you, I'm just going there myself, 
uh, it will give you the information on that. And most of our lectures now are are, um, are live broadcast. So uh, anyone will be able to. Do we Sorry? need to be a member for that? No, absolutely not. They're they're free to anyone to join. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, excellent question. I should have uh, I should have uh, mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, yes. Here we go. Bra Dr. Brian McLaren. Uh, traveling west and east from Lake Superior to Lake of the Woods, January 5, 20, January 25, sorry, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. Yeah, and that was going to be my question, Michael. That's why I saved it for the end was um, it, I couldn't quite get from the description uh, whether they were <clears throat> traveling this route or trying to document it or what the scoop was, but I guess maybe that might be part of the intrigue and why I might need to come on the in January. Yeah, yeah. But to the extent that I've heard about it, I understand they're they're primarily focused on on preserving uh, and recognizing uh, historically recognizing the significance of that route. Yeah, but. yeah. And the and the email actually included a Paul Kane painting. Um, does the museum have any of his works? Not Paul Kane, I'm afraid. No. Um, I that would, that would have been nice. Yeah. Um, Quetico probably does because they. Yes. They, yeah. yeah. We, uh, the, the main artist that was relevant to this exhibit uh, is um, uh, Armstrong, William Armstrong, who um, I guess had, shares some similarities in, 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 in focus to, uh, to Paul Kane, um, documenting many of the scenes around here uh, in the 1850s, 1860s, and a few of his works are on display as well. And that picture you showed in one of your slides, um, that's a great picture. Is it is it available to get a copy of somehow? Like yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we we typically charge fifteen dollars for high resolution scans, but uh, yeah. for anyone from this group, I I, I probably won't charge you. I, I'm okay to support the museum. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's just such a cool picture when you can see the the fort and sort of that last vest, vestiges of history, and then this new world right beside them. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great photo. It's a great photo. Oh, um, the, Carl mentions that we sell copies of Gene Morrison's book. That is a great book, but I, I, I have not seen that one. There's like one copy, and we don't sell it in our gift shop anymore because no one can get a hold of it. It's one of those books that everyone wants, um, but no one can find. So if anyone knows where to find it, I'm, I'm all ears. Which one is it? Um, Lake Superior to Rainy Lake. Oh, I've got one. Okay. This one? Yeah. Well, we, we have none in our, in our um, we have well, like a library copy and that's all we have. Mm, I think I, I bought it at the museum, I think. Maybe not, I don't know. I gotta, I gotta find out how to get more. And I have this one as well. Yeah, that one we have copies of. Okay. Excellent. So there's lots of lots to explore at the museum, and it's interesting um, when you talk about how many photos you have and and documents and old newspapers. So anyone who wants to do historical research, uh, certainly this would be a place for them to check into to see if you could be of help. Absolutely. Just send me an email. Um, some of it can be done yeah. over email. I can I can send you this and that. Um, if you're looking for a photo, I can you find it easily enough. But for anything in depth. Um, yeah. you'll want to, to come into our uh, research room and, uh, and sit down and I'll show you the documents to look at. So, yeah. but I, I welcome anyone uh, who wants to, uh, who wants to come make a, make a trip. Excellent. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I invite anybody to unmute and ask questions if you'd like. Otherwise, feel free to put questions in the chat. just in case you haven't been following along in the chat, there is lots of interesting conversation happening. So um, I encourage you to look at that. And I will be able to share uh, the chat with you as, as a follow-up. Um, so if you're missing something or want to see a resource that was mentioned, uh, you don't have to be uh, scribbling all that information down. I was going to ask that question. Thanks, yeah. Kelsey. That's well, it. Is there anybody else that wants to unmute and uh, ask a question? Otherwise, we'll give you the grace of a little extra time as we go into the, the break. Excellent. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. We really appreciate it.